So how difficult it is to raise a venture capital fund? What are the stop signs? What are the best decks to prepare for? So today we are going to hear from an institutional LP who is a managing partner of a fund of fund and an investor in some of the top VC funds like Founder Collective, Lightspeed VC, Kleiner Perkins, IVP, Battery Ventures, Maple Fund. Welcome to SheVC. I'm your founder and host, Gayatri Sarkar. Um, today we have an amazing investor with us who is an institutional LP, but also um, had invested in some of the top startups. Greg Bolin, welcome to SheVC. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to bring Greg because he had invested in some of the top VC funds. So very first thing I'm going to ask Greg, because Greg is the managing partner of Union Group Ventures. And I have asked this question to him before. How many people get confused with your fund and Union Square Ventures? I hope a lot because <laughs> I'd love to be. I'd love to be lumped in with Fred Wilson and those guys over at Union Square. You know, a few, but not many. After they talk with us about two seconds, they realize that we're not based in New York. Uh, we're not Fred Wilson. Yes. You're based in North Carolina, but you have been able to invest in some of the top uh, funds. But I'm going to start um, with, some, with a very burning question, which is, what are the stop signs when you're investing in a VC funds? Like, what are the top five? top signs, if you can, if you can tell us. So, um, the top, the top things that we, that we, that make us run away are, um, bad partnership dynamics. So when you meet with the partners, there's clearly conflict. There's, and there's, believe me, there's good conflict. There's also very unhealthy conflict. So we're looking for the unhealthy kind of conflict. Um, in partnerships. We're looking for, um, we, we don't invest in people who have not, not invested in venture before in a, in a fund type profile. So if they have been investors that are investing, you know, just out of their pocket, we, we won't follow um, in their first time fund. We do invest in first time funds, but it has to be somebody who has a track record that is attributable. So no attributable track record is another stop sign for us. Um, we, we have a, a no asshole rule, which <laughs> if people in the industry um, don't wanna see this person succeed, or there's a lot of negative chatter about the person, then it's really hard for us to get past that um, to make an investment as well. So. I don't know how many that is, but those are the primary things that, you know, immediately turn us off. No, that's great. Um, so as an LP investor, um, can you please tell us like, um, what are the kind of returns that are very attractive to you? Like you said that obviously you're not going to invest in somebody who has never done a venture before. So obviously we are not looking for an emerging fund manager, but you are looking for an experienced emerging fund manager who's coming from a different fund and has a track record. So what kind of returns that do you think are attractive as a fund investor? Three to five as a base really is the, the place where we get interested and excited in somebody's return profile. Look, this is a business of hits, right? Right. And if you're investing in, um, for example, consumer, and you weren't in the top three or four consumer deals, you're not going to have the kinds of returns. And the people that we want to invest in are, we, we call them skinny, hungry tigers. <laughs> people that, people that um, will do whatever it takes to get into, get into a fund. And that was some of the best advice that I got. Tom McMurray was with Sequoia for a number of years. Um, when I asked him why Sequoia was so successful, he said, because as partners, we're taught that you, you always find a way to get in the best deals. And I think they've demonstrated a track record of being able to do that. And consequently, we look for the same thing in our managers. We, we want our managers to consistently be able to find a way into the very best deals. And so three to five is kind of a base of return for somebody who's 
you know, generated that profile. Well, that's great. And um, venture capital is like one asset class, which is kind of very cyclical, the boom bust cycle and appetite for high risk. So considering the time diversification um, across like av above average returns tend to offset like below average returns over long investment horizons. So how do you separate Union Grove Venture Partner from other fund of funds? Uh, well, by that, by returns. So we're very focused on generating large alpha in our portfolio. You know, we've, we've consistently generated 25% um, net IRRs for all of our funds over the lifetime of our, of our partnership. And there's a reason that we do that because we pick great investors to, to invest along the side. And then we try and pick their very best investments that we think are going to generate, you know, big alpha to invest in um, with them. So that's how we differentiate ourselves is by our returns. Everybody's got a story. Everybody can get into a few really good funds. Everybody can get into um, one or two great deals, but it's, it, and you know, you'd say, well, that's luck or that's, you yeah. know, good fortune. And we just, we, we tried to show that if you consistently do it, you know, in our case over nine years, that that's pretty differentiated from, you know, being lucky once or twice. And that's right. The other thing, the other thing we don't do, and it's a lesson that I learned from my time at um, Wasatch Advisors, you never outperform dragging a big bag of assets around. And so right. we only, we only raise 300 million at a time. All we've ever raised in the past, likely all we'll ever raise in the future because we're highly focused on putting, you know, our, our best shots in our best names and our best ideas. And the problem is when you get big, you diversify out of that. And, you know, we have some friends in the business who are, you know, I have $2 billion dollars, two and a half billion dollar fund of funds, there just aren't that many good names that you have access to, to be able to get that money to work and generate the big outsized return. Great. So, it's the same, fund of funds are the same as venture funds. When they're small, a lot of times they do really, really well. And when they're big, they drop below the median because they're fee stacking. And so yes. one of the things that we focused on is you know, our compensation as partners, what is our compensation comprised of? And so we have something called a PC ratio, which is a partner's comp ratio. Yeah. And also named because my partner's name is, one of my partner's names is Patrick Cairns. Yes. Or PC. <laughs> but um, we look at what, the, how a partner's been compensated. So in our case, roughly 70% of our total compensation has come from carry, 30% hmm. for management fees. And we look, we know that that's outsized. We don't expect our managers to have that same kind of consistent performance, particularly early in their careers, but that's what we want people to shoot for. We want people to make money the same way that we make money, which is on generating alpha and carry. Great. You touch base a little bit about this, that, um, you know, there are a lot of funds which are getting bigger and bigger. There are billion dollar funds. And then there are funds which are trying to stay at the same same size like Union Square Ventures or Foundry Group, you know? So there, there's definitely a change that we are seeing in the last five years in the venture capital community. A lot of micro venture funds, a lot of funds which are like $25 million, $50 million, $75 million fund. And then there are a lot of funds which are billion dollar funds. So how do you think those changes will come in effect, especially in the last three months with COVID-19 happening, how do you think that the market is going to change? And I know I'm asking you a question about like look into the uh, your future kind, but what do you think? Because you talked about um, consistency, which is nothing but talking about how it's important to be a disciplined investor, you know? So to tell me, what do you think about the future in the venture capital industry? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, my crystal ball, I think, is one of those shake-up <laughs> snow globes because it's always hazy. Um, it's really, it's it's a time of transition. And we've always talked about a barbelling effect of small funds on the left side, large funds on the right side. 
Yeah. That's become even more pronounced because on the right side of the barbell, you have hedge funds, you have mutual funds, you have um, SPVs, you have family offices. Everybody's trying to throw money in on the left-hand side of the barbell. And so it's gotten um, really big. And I think it's become a lot more difficult to generate outsized returns by investing there. So, you know, it, it's the garbage collector's theory of investing. You go <laughs> where nobody else wants to go and you'll get rewarded because nobody else wants to go there. So that's why we spend a lot of time on the early stage, seed stage, pre-seed stage investors, because right now we think they have a peculiar advantage. And we don't know how long that will remain, but we, we see that there is just a lot more opportunity to generate alpha there than there is on the other side of the fund curve. No, that's great. So if somebody wants to be an institutional LP like you, tell us about your past experiences that helped you to have this kind of knowledge and thinking because you had been an institutional investor in the past. So how was that experience that helped you to shape uh, how Union Grove uh, Venture Partner should be? So my, my, I was a, I started off as an investment banker, started off as a commercial banker, went into investment banking and then transitioned to, um, I was a CFO for a, a venture fund for about a year, which was a great experience. And then had the opportunity to go to work for Wasatch Advisors, which had been an investment banking client. And Wasatch started a program that was focused on um, trying to get inside information um, into private companies so that they would be able to invest and capture a more significant share of the return. And Wasatch at the time, and I still believe it is, is probably the, one of the best small and micro cap investors in the universe. And they generate, you know, consistently had generated these outsized returns. And so there were a huge number of lessons that I took away from their experience as public investors um, investing in the private side. And the fascinating thing for me was their laser focus on, you know, a set of metrics that they look for to invest. And um, it really helped me to develop my own set of metrics on things to look for and things to look away from or, you know, to not, to not invest in um, to try and be successful. And that said, you know, I have my share of zeros. So, I, you know, I'm no different than anybody else. We, I, I think in the partnership, I tend to be more risky than the other investors. And so, you know, I, I have some, some 50X multiples and I have some zero multiples. <laughs> That's the parallel return uh, investing in the venture side. Um, uh, so obviously you touched about this, that, you know, venture capital is investing in um, identifying um, the patterns in time. And yet some of the bigger ideas are unpredictable. And sometimes those investment decisions can be non-consensus among partners. So when you are investing in amazing funds or startups, um, you're also some, uh, an investor in some of the top startups like Angie's List. You're an investor in um, um, Beyond Mead. You're an investor also in a couple of great other companies. Um, Poshmark. Um, can you talk about what are your investment theses when you're investing in those um, top startups? Because you are a late stage investor. You're not investing in people. You're more investing in looking at their ARR, what's their churn rate, like how they are product market fit. I mean, how they have established a better product market fit um, and more they're becoming, they're basically rising in the, in the rank of incumbents. So you are an investor mostly in Series B, Series C. Sometimes you are often a lead investor. So how, what do you think are your investment theses is in that? Um, well, we try and go where we can make a lot of money. Um, and generally that happens with management teams that we have a, got a high degree of confidence in. Or it happens with other board members mm -hmm. that we have a high degree of confidence in. Um, well, we have an expression that we want to we want to be best friends with people who see around corners, wow. and we um, we ourselves don't always see around corners. 
In fact, we've not seen around a couple of corners that I wish we had seen around, but we have been fortunate to have partnered with people who have seen around corners. And, you know, Beyond Meat, I, I think maybe they had a million dollars of revenue when we invested in Beyond oh, wow. Meat. But our primary two, my primary two themes, and each of us have different themes in the partnership, are transparency and efficiency. And so if I can see a place where there's a company that's going to add a lot of transparency to a marketplace or add a huge amount of efficiency to a marketplace, and by efficiency, I don't mean a, you know, an incremental 3%, but an incremental, you know, maybe 90% or 100% of efficiency over the current standard, then that gets me really excited. And then beyond me, we had both because, um, the efficiency of a, you know, a cow converting corn or grass into protein is about a 13% efficiency ratio. The efficiency of the, the Beyond Meat process of converting grain into protein was about a 93 or a 94% efficiency. So, you know, even more than an inverse opposite, it was so much more efficient that it was incredible. And then the transparency, you know, they were heavily criticized during the early stage of the IPO for, uh, for you know, being a uh, processed food. And so I, got, I, I was on a, on a debate with the beef, pro, beef processors, beef producers, of which you know, I'm a member of the beef producers because I had cattle for a long time. And they said, you know, well, this is a highly processed food. And I said, look, we'll, we'll put our cameras up on our processing floor if you put cameras up on your processing floor, which is, of course, the kill floor. And that ended the conversation about processing. They didn't want to talk <laughs> about that. Anymore. I love your so, attitude. <laughs> yeah, the efficiency. So those are the two things that drive my, my really pique my interest in a company. And... Um, I used to mow grass when I was a kid for Dwayne Andreas, who was at the time the, the CEO of Archer Daniels Midland. And he would be kind enough to stop and, you know, talk to me while I was busy sweating away mowing, the, mowing his grass. And one of the things he told me was when I was, you know, a young kid, look, if you're going to be a commodity producer, you're the low because you'll last longer than anybody else in the space. And so that's where I kind of really started thinking about efficiency and how efficiency drives processes. That's great. And you talked about, this, this is amazing, how efficiency drives process. Um, you're talking about ARR and we are seeing in the past, a lot of investors are pumping money into startups so that they can run 100 miles per hour. And obviously that's how VC funds work, you know, that's how VCs want their returns to be. But the companies that are built on higher leverages, they are basically betting on certainty. But in a time like this, where we are finding those are the companies that are betting on certainty are finding it difficult to survive. Do you think there will be a change in the way we invest in the venture capital world? And there will be more focus from the VC side and also from the startup side to bring more profitability and ARR rather than chasing a market where their profitability is not there in the picture. Because I remember last time when we spoke, you talked about how important it is to chase profitability and also find that opportunity of not just monetization, but also there is a path to profitability. Yeah, so if you're a company and you, you can't figure out the right dials to turn to become profitable, then the odds are you're probably not gonna make it. Unless you know you're you're so transformational in a process that eventually people will reward you for you know who you are as a market leader in transformation. There just aren't very many of those. You know, if you look through history, you know, there's always kind of one per cycle per industry. And if you aren't invested in those, then you damn well better be, you know, able to turn dials and become profitable quick. And that's actually one of the things that it's a stop sign for us on a company mm. is if people can't figure out um, how to, to change dials to become profitable, whether you need to or not is a whole other issue, right? 
Right. You, you may be able to chase growth. And then when you get to the high growth, turn the dials to become profitable and thus be able to be, become an investable public company. But, you know, people, people, and I keep going back beyond me as an example, but for years, you know, we were, we were trying to compete against beef, beef in the, in the shelves. And there just were two or three events that happened that significantly changed the whole investment profile. And the, you know, the people got excited and it, it always seems to happen like that, that there's just one thing that happens. And if you're there and if you're able to, you know, turn a couple of dials quickly and able to monetize that opportunity that propels you to become a great company. And, and you know, and in my mind, that's the, for example, the, the pandemic, you know, when I was on the board member, we always talked about swine flu. We talked about bird flu. We talked about mad cow disease, you know, prions, some, some combination of those forcing people to, um, adopt the healthier lifestyle of, of using the, the vegan meat. And we never dreamed that day that it would cause, you know, demand to rise so significantly for the meat. Um, but it, yeah. it just goes to show that we were at the right time, right place with the right, you know, the, the right ability to turn the dice. So kudos to those guys for what they've been able to do. And, you know, I think that's emblematic of that company's life history. You know, we never raise money at the highest valuation. We, we, we kept the company very tightly controlled in terms of capital spend. And if you look at the, at the capital spend per dollar of revenue generated for that company, it eclipsed that very quickly. And um, our competitors did not and still have not. They're out raising billions of dollars and can't figure out how to get margin profitable. So, you know, that having that ability, the management ability to keep your eye on the ball, keep your eye on the numbers and, and be able to change those dials if the opportunity presents itself is really important. That's great. You talked about something that um, I'm, I'm actually writing a blog about it that I've seen that even with a company like Lego, they also had this huge problem. They're creating so many features and none of them are working that great because they forgot their most important feature, which is built the interlocking bricks. And now they have come from bankruptcy and now they are one of the most valued, um, you know, not just toy company, but a valued brand. So this is a very important thing that you talked about that one matrix that matters that sometimes the entrepreneurs forget. What are the other stop signs do you find when you're investing in startups? that you think like, do you find it very difficult if the partners uh, are not aligned or if the founders, if there's a single founder, do you find those are the stop signs? Yeah, well, we actually, we have a list of, I think it's now 68 reasons not to invest. <laughs> and that's called the university of hard knocks. You know, it's where we made an investment and it didn't go well. And what were the stop signs that we ran? And that was a process that, I, that I've been able to enjoy my entire life, but was particularly um, particularly driven into me at Wasatch Advisors because if there was something that didn't work, they would you know immediately dissect it. And I used to hate those meetings, you know, where you go through and you you know have to say, well, I missed this or I missed that or respect I should have known that this was you know the way that you know the world. Or, Whatever it was, whatever the stop signs were, whatever the reason were that the company wasn't successful, you know, you had to bury your soul in the partnership. And right. um, I used to hate those, but now I've come to love them because that's where I learned by just leaps and bounds, you know, things to avoid. And, and there's a lot of things that, that make me really, you know, go ears up. And we have an expression in our, in our partnership you can run a couple of stop signs, but when you run a, you know, a whole city of stop signs, you're, you know, you ought not to make the investment. And my partners are very good at reminding me that I'm running stop signs. <laughs> I love that. And we, we also talked about like, as an investor, like you have invested in some top um, funds, whether it's Founder Collective, IVP, 
You're also an investor in uh, Battery Ventures. You have invested in Tiger Global Management, in Techstars. And these are some of the top funds that we know. Um, when you're investing in these funds, I, I just really like to know, um, in a time like this, when you find that idiosyncratic risk play a bigger role, can you talk about the systemic risk that lies inherent as a part of the investment platform? And that is that lies for everyone, whether it's Sequoia, Axel, or Founder Collective, or Unigro Ventures, and how do you overcome those challenges in a time like this? Yeah, boy, it's really difficult because we have a, we have a rule where we we have to meet whoever we're investing in face to face. And we like for the whole partnership to meet that person. And I, you know, we haven't broken it yet because we've still been working on names and people that we've known and, you know, ideas that we've had for a long time. We're going to run out of those at some point. And that's when we're going to have to seriously reevaluate that rule. Are we willing to make an investment where we haven't actually put our eyes on somebody um, and been able to, you know, feel the energy to be able to have the eye contact. And that's a, that's a big thing for us is mm -hmm. to, um, we talk about walking away from meetings with a good feeling or a bad feeling and um, excitement or, you know, a lot of times we're excited when we walk in and by the time we walk out, you know, <laughs> the excitement goes down and, you know, we have to examine why, what, you know, what was it about that meeting? What was it about that partnership that made us lose enthusiasm? And contrawise, you know, there've been times where we've said, hey, you know, I went into this meeting thinking it was gonna be awful. And, you know, now I'm kind of excited about the whole thing. So we have to spend a lot of time being focused on, you know, why it is that things change, what the, what the transition, and what the transformation is that occurs um, through those meetings. And now that we can't have those, you know, that's a big part of our partnership decisions. So right. that's, that's going to be a big change for us that, you know, if this continues, how do we, how do we mitigate that going forward? And we spend a lot of time talking about that risk in the partnership about how do we, how are we able to overcome those kinds of challenges or questions that we just can't get anymore. Now that, that's um, very interesting. And then there are some there are some things that we just so I think my friend Mary Meeker did a great job of taking a look at this early in the process, and said um, there are some businesses that are going to be advanced five or six quarters through this time period, and there are some businesses that are going to go backwards five or six quarters through this time period, and so the key is to know which one is which and who's investing in which ones and what their rationale are. So, you know, like tra we won't invest in a travel business now. Mm -hmm. We won't invest in um, a business that is an outdoor event space promoter or an out, you know, provider or, you know, some other, some other aspect of outdoor events. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just a really tough time. Yes. Those guys, and we don't know how long it's going to be until all this gets sorted out. And you know what? We may miss opportunities because we, we've, in essence, redlined those kinds of businesses. But I think better to miss that than to invest in it and catch a, you know, try and catch a falling knife. Yes, yes, 100%. So as an experienced fund manager, what are the tips you want to give to an emerging fund manager, like people who are starting their own VC funds or starting their own fund of funds? So I, I'm going to pass on the Tom McMurray tip, which is find the way to be in the very best deals. You know, whatever it takes, you know, whether you have to chase the entrepreneur, entrepreneur down at dinner, whether you, you know, whatever it takes, find a way into those good deals and convince them that you need to be in those deals. The reason is that you learn so much once you're inside one of those deals that's irreplaceable. You know, people say, you know, luck tends to follow luck. And right. the reason that that happens is because people learn, you know, 
what has to happen, the signs to look for, how things feel. Then you begin to know people that you're able to bring in and you know work with. And so that's number one. Find find your way into the very best deals. Number two, be willing to make mistakes. Um, you know, if, if I have a, a friend who's a VC manager and he has analysis paralysis. <laughs> he, he spends, you know, six or nine months trying to make a decision. And by the time he's made the decision, it's too late. He's missed the opportunity or the, the market's passed him by. Um, so be willing to make mistakes. Find people who make you better and lean heavily on those people. So if, if you're going to be a sole GP, you better find people who challenge your way of thinking and who make you smarter over the long run. If you're in a partnership, your partnership should always challenge you and make you better over the long run. And again, I'm fortunate. I have two partners who are a lot smarter than I am. But, <laughs> you have, um, but if you don't have that, you don't have that system of internal checks, you, you never know when you... You know, you're smarter than you, you think you're smarter than you really are. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. I, I think you don't want to be in a room where you're the most smartest person. You better run away from that room. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't have that problem. So. <laughs> I love easy. that. <laughs> Last time when I spoke with you, um, you talked about something which is, which has ingrained in me so much, like, it is a statement, it is a quote of one of my favorite heroes, Sir Edmund Hillary. And he said, it isn't the mountains ahead to climb that wear you out. It's the pebble in your shoe. So you, when you said that, wh why did you, like, wh why do you think like that? And what it takes to be successful in this industry? Because that has such a deep meaning uh, and not just venture capital, but also uh, the, the tips to be successful. I, I would love to know your take on that. So it, it comes back to persistence. Um, that's right. You, if you aren't persistent, you're never going to be successful in this business. This is a long run business. We used to say it takes three to five years to know if you're any good. The reality is it probably takes 10 years to know if you're any good. And if you stay, if you keep hungry, if you keep, determined to learn, if you keep determined to um, be a sponge and absorb everything that you can, read everything that you can, listen to everything that you can, it's amazing how much smarter you get over a period of three to five years. And so the problem is that people tend to get, people tend to get worn out, they tend to get burned out. Yeah. Um, because of the, this is a, you know, it's a business of drudgery. You know, I think everybody decides that, hey, it's really, you know, it's the, it's the hot thing to be a VC because well, there you are, you know, making million dollar decisions with the stroke of a pen. <laughs> the reality is, is there's a lot of just dirty, hard, unpleasant work that you've got to do to be able to make that one, one million dollar decision. Yes. And that's, that wears on you. And you feel like the pace, you know, you're not going as fast as you want to go. You're not getting where you want to be as fast as you want to go. But it's a process. And this is not a business that, um, I, I don't believe it's a business that can be taught. Yeah. I believe it's a business that you have to have inside of you. When you get up every morning, it has to be the most exciting thing about your entire day. Those are the people we want to invest in. Because those are the people who end up seeing around corners because they always spend time bumping up against the best and the brightest and they seek out, um, they seek out new information that other people don't have. And right. that's how great investors get made. At least well, that's all the great investors that I know. This is great. I, I thanks a lot for your time. And I think, we learned a lot from you because you talked about certain things that most of the venture capitalists, they strive to be, but you have seen, you have invested, you've experienced some of the top VC fund managers, and we are so happy to have you and hear from the greatest thing. 
I wanted to ask one last question. How does people reach out to you if they want to contact Union Grove Venture Partners? So we have, we, we made it really difficult with our email addresses to <laughs> contact us. So we got, we literally were one letter away from the shortest email address that's accessible in the system. So my email address is G, my first initial Greg, at UGVP.com, Union Grove Venture Partners.com. So very simple, very easy to get a hold of. And I listen to everything and everyone because I've still got a lot to learn. That's great. Thanks a lot, Greg, for your time. The show. Thank you. Um, so thanks, Greg. Thanks a lot for being on the show. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, share what little knowledge I have. Thank you, Greg.